Today, we're taking a look at five unpredictable cases filled with twists. The final case we're covering just might be the most baffling of all. Scott Ponder opened up a motorcycle and power sports dealership in 2001 in South Carolina that he called Superbike Motorsports. The business thrived and he was soon able to hire his close friend Brian Lucas to work as the service manager. Everything seemed to be going great for Scott. Business was booming and had become a hangout for fellow motorbike enthusiasts, and he was happily married to a woman named Melissa Ponder Brackman. In fact, in 2003, the couple was expecting their first child together. On November 6, 2003, Noel Lee, a regular to hang out at the Superbike Motorsports dealership, called ahead to see if they were too busy for him to drop by. He was told they weren't, and he arrived at the shop about 10 minutes after he called. He walked in to find both Scott and Brian lying in a pool of blood in the shop's parking lot. Lee thought it was a gruesome prank. The guys had been fine only a few minutes earlier. He told them to get up and even poked at Brian with his foot. But when neither responded, he realized it was no prank. Lee ran into the shop to call 911, but inside he only found more horror. Scott's mother, Beverly Guy, often liked to help out at the shop and Lee found her body lying on the floor near the bathroom. Farther in, he discovered the recently hired mechanic, Chris Sherbert, slumped over a bike he had been working on. All four people at the shop had been shot and killed. As soon as police arrived, they were puzzled by the four-person murder scene. The easiest explanation would have been that it was a robbery gone wrong, but nothing had been taken, and easily accessible cash was even left in plain sight. As the investigation got underway, there was a lead right away. The last person to see the four victims alive was a customer at the shop only a few minutes before everyone died. This customer claimed that they saw a man in the dealership inquiring about a motorcycle and heard him talk as though he was new to bikes. But investigators couldn't find the identity of this mystery second customer. Police then turned to an unlikely person to investigate, Scott's widow, Melissa. She was questioned a number of times, including after she gave birth to her and Scott's son, Scott Jr. During one visit to the station, she changed her baby's diaper, and without her knowledge, the police took the diaper from the trash and ran a DNA test on her child. The result was surprising. Melissa's baby's DNA didn't match the DNA sample from Scott. Instead, it matched his best friend, Brian. When this strange finding was brought to Melissa's attention, she adamantly denied it and demanded they run another test. This second test came back with the same result. The baby's DNA matched Brian, not Scott. Hearing this, Melissa refused to speak to the police further, which raised their suspicions against her. For about 18 months, suspicion surrounded Melissa, and police watched her every move closely, but there was still no evidence tying her directly to the case. Eventually, investigators decided to take a look at Beverly and Brian's DNA, though they didn't specify why. They found that Beverly's DNA didn't match her son's. That's when police realized Scott's and Brian's DNA samples had been mixed up. Melissa was vindicated, her son was Scott's, and she was no longer under suspicion. In 2004, the sheriff's office brought in the former FBI agent and renowned serial killer profile John Douglas for aid. But for over a decade, police struggled to find any other leads. Though hundreds of people were questioned over the years, the Superbike murders became a cold case. It wasn't until another seemingly unrelated crime occurred that an answer was finally uncovered. In 2016, 13 years after the Superbike murders, Caleb Brown and her boyfriend Charles David Carver went missing. They had been helping to clean a property for a real estate agent when something suspicious occurred. Their families believed they were missing, but they were still receiving Facebook messages. These messages claimed the couple had gotten married, bought a house, and were happy but wanted to be left alone. The strange part was that they refused to call their families, which raised their suspicion that something just wasn't right. Following the couple's last known location by pinging their phones, police ended up on a 95-acre property owned by a real estate agent named Todd Kolhep. Kolhep had a criminal record as a registered offender and had served 15 years in prison in 1987 for assault and kidnapping. On the property, police found something out of a grisly horror movie. They found Kayla where she was being held chained up, 
as police described like a dog in a metal shipping container. She'd been living captive in the container for more than two months, but thankfully she was mostly unharmed, though obviously shaken. Once she was rescued, Kayla told the gruesome story of how Kolhep and Charles got into an argument and Kolhep pulled out a gun and shot him. Charles David Carver was found dead on the property with three holes in his shirt, each hole made by the bullets entering his chest. As police searched Kolhep's property, they found another gruesome discovery. The bodies of Johnny Coxey and Megan McCraw Coxey were also unearthed. The couple had been missing since 2015. In an even more disturbing twist, the feet were missing from the bodies, including Carver's. Though Kolhev claimed he had no idea why the feet were missing from the bodies, even saying, my mother told me never to play with my food. Investigators said they hadn't been chewed off by animals and looked as though they were removed in a suspicious way. Personally, I can't imagine a not suspicious way to remove feet. Once he was taken into custody, Cole Hepp was interrogated, and during one interview, he admitted to having killed more people than the three bodies police knew about. He told a story about how he had visited a bike shop back in 2003. At the shop, he told the employees that his own motorbike had been stolen, but that he wanted to buy another. While there, he said he was given a hard time, claiming that an employee implied to him that they had been involved in stealing his first bike. He said that he returned a few more times, and at each visit he was mocked. Eventually, he decided to take his revenge. He waited for other customers to leave before he went into the shop and killed the four people there. Kolhep was the man responsible for the superbike murders. What's especially disturbing to consider is that before Kolhep was found, the police were given a list of 400 superbike customers collected by a private investigator hired by Brian's family. The list had highlighted 15 names, including Kolhep's, because he had a criminal record. It's believed that the list was never fully investigated. Perhaps if it had been looked into closer, Kolhep would have been stopped before he took more lives. However, one interesting theory has arisen since Kolhep's arrest, that he actually didn't commit the superbike murders and only took responsibility to build his reputation as a serial killer. When he explained what happened that day in 2003, he said he had shot all four victims in the forehead, but none of them had gunshot wounds to the forehead. He also got the type of bullets used in the killings wrong and the placement of where Scott and Brian were killed. During a few interviews, he even denied having killed them at all. These inconsistencies were explained away by investigators saying that the details could be confused after 13 years, and they were sure that he was involved in the four deaths. Todd Kolhep is currently serving life sentences in prison for killing seven people. Do you think he's responsible for them? In the late 1960s, the List family appeared to be living the American dream. John List, the vice president of a bank, and his wife, Helen, his mother, and three children lived together in a mansion in Westfield, New Jersey, with 19 rooms, including a ballroom and marble fireplaces. Even though the family looked like they had everything, it was all appearances. In 1971, John lost his job, and he struggled to find another job. Instead of telling his family what was going on, as he thought that it was too shameful to admit, he would get up every day, almost as if he was heading to work, but instead went and sat at the train station, where he spent all day reading the newspaper and taking naps. But he no longer had an income and couldn't pay the bills, Instead of going on welfare, because then the whole community would know about his struggles, he started to secretly steal money from his mother's bank account in order to keep paying for his mortgage. But this plan could only last for so long. When the bank threatened to foreclose on the house, John realized that all his lies would be exposed. He decided there was only one thing to do. John List was going to disappear. To begin his thorough plan, he headed to the post office where he stopped the family's mail then he went to the bank and cashed in his mother's savings bonds. Once home, he made several calls to everyone who would check on them and said that the rest of the List family had already left for North Carolina to visit his wife's mother and said that he was planning to follow them soon. That way, no one would go looking for them. John then went through his house with scissors and cut himself out of every picture in order to make it harder for anyone to track him down. After this, he went to the John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. 
Instead of boarding a plane, he left his car as a fake clue and took a bus into the city. John List was gone. Because John had said the family would be away for a while, no one thought it was odd that they didn't see any of the Lists. It wasn't until a month later that the police knocked on the door of the List mansion. Inside, they found the family, or at least most of them. Laying on the floor of the ballroom were the bodies of John's wife and three children. All had been shot. Upstairs, also shot dead, was John's mother. There was a confession letter at the scene. It was addressed to John's pastor. John List hadn't run away from his family. He'd killed them all and then fled. But where had John gone? There was no sign of him. The only clue was the car at the airport, but then his trail went cold. And it stayed cold for years. The List's murder was regularly revisited, but it wasn't until 1989, 18 years after the murders, that the case was featured on America's Most Wanted. It included a picture of John List created by a forensic sculptor's impression of how he would currently look. In Denver, a group of neighbors recognized the man on the TV, but it wasn't John List. It was a man they knew by the name of Robert P. Clark. Recognizing Clark and John as the same person, the neighbors called the police. Eleven days later, John List was finally found and arrested. After fleeing the crime scene at his home in 1971, John took the name of Robert P. Clark. He traveled unnoticed to Denver, where he worked as a hotel fry cook and then later as an accountant for H&R Block. In 1985, John got remarried to a widow named Dolores Clark, and the two of them moved to Richmond, Virginia. In court, all of John's crimes were exposed. On November 9, 1971, the three kids headed off to school. As soon as they were gone, John stood behind his wife and shot her while she drank her morning coffee. Then he went to find his 84-year-old mother, where she was eating breakfast upstairs, gave her a kiss, and shot her in the head. He used an old 9mm pistol he bought as a World War II souvenir and a 22 caliber target pistol. Following his careful plan, John dragged his wife's body into the ballroom and cleaned up the blood to not alarm his children when they got home. While he waited, he called around to make it look like the family would be away in a show of callousness. John took a break from cleaning up his wife's blood and made himself a sandwich. As his kids came home, John killed each of them one by one. First was 16-year-old Patricia, Patty, then the youngest, 13-year-old Frederick. John apparently went to support his 15-year-old son, John Jr., at his high school soccer game before driving him home and shooting him too. He dragged all the bodies into the ballroom, though he left his mother upstairs. Disturbingly, John slept in the house with the bodies overnight. The next day, he left the house lights on, turned on music, and made his great escape. List had actually watched the America's Most Wanted program about him with his second wife, but she didn't put it together that it was him. John's twisted justification for killing his family was that this was the only way to save them and ensure they went to heaven. In 1990, John List was found guilty and sentenced to five life terms. He claimed to be sorry for, quote, the tragedy that happened in 1971, but he never mentioned his wife, his mother, or his children. At 82 years old, John died in prison in 2008. On October 31st, 1992, Candace Fonicky went to the hospital in Kipling, Canada. She wasn't seeking medical aid, but was looking for her friend to talk to after she had just had a big argument with her boyfriend. Her friend wasn't working, but because she was so agitated over the fight, a nurse suggested she should see one of the doctors. Dr. John Schneeberger was available and agreed to see Fonagy. He told her that taking a sedative would probably calm her down, and she agreed that he was right. Instead of being given a pill, as she expected, Schneeberger gave Fonagy an injection, but the feeling wasn't quite what she expected because instead of just feeling calmer, she felt completely and immediately numb. Fonagy's memory after the injection was foggy, but when she finally came to again, she was sure something horrible had happened to her. She was certain that while unconscious, Schneeberger had simply assaulted her. She went straight to the police to report the disturbing incident and gave samples. Police found traces of semen in her underwear and pants, as well as evidence of the drug that the doctor had given her. Upon closer inspection, 
The drug Schneeberger had injected her with was identified as the powerful anesthetic, Versed, also known as Mitazolam, which induces sleepiness and decreases anxiety, but it also inhibits the creation of new memories. It's also normally used before medical procedures or for people who are on mechanical ventilators because it will decrease their consciousness. In other words, it's not a drug normally used for circumstances like Fonagy's and was a strange choice for Schneeberger to give her. It looked like Fonagy was right and the doctor had assaulted her after ensuring she was helpless. When police approached Schneeberger about the allegations, he volunteered to give a blood sample to the police to be compared to the sample they had collected from Fonagy. His DNA didn't match. The first sample Schneeberger had given the police wasn't taken under police supervision, but a second sample was taken a year later under police watch. This sample also didn't match. Schneeberger offered up an explanation for Fonagy's allegations. He said that the drug he gave her was occasionally known to cause hallucinations of sexual activity, which could explain why she was sure something had happened while she was unconscious. Until the second sample was taken, the community had supported Fonagy, but now people were sure she was lying about the whole thing. Because there was no proof of any wrongdoing, the police stopped investigating. But Fonagy did give up. She hired a private investigator to get a sample of Schneeberger's DNA. She wanted to test it at a private lab, but as you can imagine, getting a sample of someone's blood isn't exactly easy to do. Most people notice when they're bleeding and are pretty wary about someone approaching them with a needle. The private investigator grabs something easier, Schneeberger's chapstick. His DNA from the chapstick was tested, and this matched the DNA sample from the semen found on Fonagy. With this evidence, Fonagy launched a civil trial against Schneeberger. But in order to be successful, his DNA had to be taken again in front of witnesses to ensure that it was admissible. Once again, Schneeberger agreed. The technician tried to draw blood from his finger, but Schneeberger only agreed to give a sample from his arm. Though his vein was visible, the technician struggled to actually get blood out. The resulting sample didn't have enough DNA for testing, and so Fonagy's case was once again dropped. For years, Fonagy struggled to get her case to be taken up again. No one believed her anymore. That is, until 1997, when Schneeberger's wife, Lisa, went to the police to allege that he had been injecting his 15-year-old stepdaughter at night with a drug and then repeatedly assaulting her. After two allegations, police took a more thorough approach to the case and retrieved more than a blood sample from Schneeberger. This time, they took the blood from his finger, and they also took some of his hair. The DNA results were baffling. Schneeberger's DNA was the perfect match for the semen sample found on Fonagy years earlier. But how was it possible that none of the other blood samples matched until now? He was arrested, but the sinister truth wasn't revealed until trial in 1999. Schneeberger admitted that he had been evading giving the police a true blood sample by slicing open his arm and implanting a 15-centimeter Penrose drain directly into his arm. He filled the drain with blood he had taken from a patient. When police took a sample from his arm, he guided them to the tube so that they extracted another man's blood. He had even added anticoagulants to keep the blood from degrading too much. But by the third blood sample, it was over two years later, and he had almost run out of blood, which was why the technician struggled to get a usable sample. Despite admitting this, Schneeberger still denied that he had assaulted Fonagy. He claimed that the semen sample found on her had been stolen from him. How? He said she took the semen from a used condom. No one bought this story, and Schneeberger was convicted of and obstruction of justice for the bizarre blood tube in his arm and was sentenced to six years in prison. In May 2010, the family of 26-year-old Army veteran Sam Herr became worried when he didn't make it home for the weekend. They called the Orange Coast College student's phone, but he didn't answer. As their concern grew, his parents decided to check his apartment in Costa Mesa, California. They could never have expected the horror that they found inside. Lying face down on Sam's bed was a dead woman. The young woman's pants were ripped and pulled down around her ankles. It appeared as though she had been assaulted. There was a bullet wound in her head. She wore a tiara, and written on her back was, quote, All yours, you. 
Sam's family had accidentally stumbled upon a gruesome crime scene, but there was no sign of Sam anywhere in the apartment. They worried that he'd also been attacked and was wounded somewhere. When police responded to the scene, they didn't begin looking for Sam as a missing person like his family wanted, but as a person of interest in the death of the woman in his apartment. The young woman was identified as 23-year-old Julie Juri Kibuishi, a college student and dancer. Sam's family actually knew of her as he had told his father that Juri was his friend and like a kid sister to him. Despite this, police were sure that Sam had killed Juri as all the evidence pointed to him being the only other person in his apartment when she died. They began a huge manhunt for Sam, assuming he was a fugitive on the run. The first lead came when they looked at his ATM records and saw that he was still withdrawing money. But when they apprehended the person taking out Sam's money, they found a 16-year-old with his ATM card, not Sam. The teen admitted that he had been asked to take the money out for someone else, but again, it wasn't Sam. It was a young man named Daniel Wozniak. Daniel, a community theater actor, lived next door to Sam at the apartment complex, and the two were friends. At first, police believed that Daniel was aiding Sam, helping to funnel him money while he was on the run, but there was still no sign of Sam. In order to question him about the suspicious ATM withdrawals, Daniel was arrested while partying at his own bachelor party in Huntington Beach. Under questioning, Daniel said that he had seen Sam leave his apartment with an unidentified man who was wearing a black hat. But then, after hours of denying any knowledge, he quickly gave up the entire ruse. Daniel admitted that he had been the one to kill Jury, and he told police where they would find Sam. If there was any hope that investigators would find him alive, it all ended when Sam's severed head was discovered dumped in bushes at the El Dorado Nature Center in Long Beach. He had been shot twice in the head. Daniel soon admitted that he had killed Sam too. Daniel said that he had asked Sam for help moving furniture in the attic of a theater where Daniel often acted in the community productions. While they moved the furniture, Daniel shot and killed him, stealing his ATM card, wallet, and cell phone. To hide the evidence more easily, Daniel dismembered Sam's body with a hatchet and saw. But why had he done it? And why kill Jury too? At the time of the slayings, Daniel didn't have a full-time job. He had no money, and he was on the verge of being evicted from his apartment. As he'd been arrested at his bachelor party, he was about to get married and was becoming desperate for money to pay for his upcoming wedding and honeymoon. Not knowing just how desperate Daniel was, Sam had mentioned that he had saved $62,000 from his combat pay from his service in Afghanistan. Daniel's plan had been to steal Sam's money from his bank account to pay for his honeymoon. As tragic as Sam's death was, Jury got caught in the middle of Daniel's wicked plan. In a truly sinister turn of events, Daniel used Sam's phone to lure her over to Sam's apartment. As the two were friends and classmates, Jury headed over when she received a message from Sam saying that he had family problems and that he just needed a girl's shoulder to cry on. Once at the apartment, Daniel shot her and staged her body and the scene to look like she had been assaulted and framed Sam, all in an attempt to cover his tracks. In 2016, Daniel Wozniak was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. He has yet to be executed. On January 2, 2018, year-old Zeb Quinn left work at Walmart in Asheville, North Carolina, in order to meet up with a friend the friend in question was Robert Jason Owens, and the two were going to look at a vehicle that Quinn was interested in buying. They met at a gas station around 9 p.m. and set off separately. Owens' Ford pickup truck leading the way with Quinn's light blue Mazda protege following. When they neared T.C. Robertson High School on Long Shoals Road, Quinn flashed his headlights to signal for Owens to pull over. Because this was before everyone had a cell phone handy, Quinn wanted to find a payphone, because he had received a page and needed to make a phone call. Whoever Quinn had talked to on the phone left him frantic when he returned to where Owens was waiting 10 minutes later. He canceled their plans and jumped into his car. Quinn was so upset that when he tried to drive away, he accidentally rear-ended Owens' truck. He paused only long enough to say sorry before he took off. That was the last time Owens ever saw Quinn. Later that evening, in the early hours on January 3rd, 
Owen's luck took a turn for the worse. After leaving his frantic friend, Owen's got in another car crash, but this one was far worse as he ended up in the hospital with head injuries and a broken rib. But a police report was never filed about an accident. While one friend ended up injured, something stranger happened to the other. Two days after he received the mysterious page, Quinn called into his work and told them that he couldn't work his shift that day. But the employee who answered the phone was certain that whoever was on the other end wasn't Quinn because they didn't recognize his voice. On January 4th, Quinn's mother, Denise Flahakis, officially filed a missing persons report for him. No one had actually seen him since that night with Owens and his family was certain he would never have left them of his own accord. Beginning the investigation, police traced the mysterious page. It was sent from his aunt's house, but she denied that she had ever sent him a page. In fact, she wasn't even home the night Quinn disappeared because she was having dinner with a friend. Curiously, the aunt later filed a police report and said that her house had been broken into while she was out that night. Searching for him, police traced the call to Quinn's work. It led to the Volvo plant where Owens worked. Owens admitted that he had been the one to make the call, but said that before he disappeared, Quinn had asked him to call into his work for him and say he was sick. Interestingly, after this statement, Owens refused to talk to the police anymore. Though he was a person of interest because he may have been the last person to see Quinn, there was no evidence connecting him to any crime. As there wasn't even proof, a crime had happened. Two weeks later, the first real clue about what happened to Quinn was discovered. His car was found parked out front of Little Pig's Barbecue, but there was no sign of Quinn. On the back windshield of the car, a large pair of lips and two exclamation points had been drawn in lipstick. Strange, right? Well, that's only the beginning of the weirdness surrounding the vehicle. Inside, police found a live black Labrador puppy that didn't belong to Quinn and a plastic hotel key that couldn't be traced to any one or any hotel. There was also a jacket that wasn't Quinn's and the driver's seat had been adjusted for someone shorter than him. I know you're wondering about what happened to the puppy, but don't worry, it was adopted by one of the investigators. One theory was that a girl he had been interested in, Misty Taylor, had accidentally gotten Quinn into trouble. Misty had a boyfriend, Wesley Smith, and he had allegedly threatened Quinn earlier the same day he went missing. Later, a couple called the police and said that they saw someone driving Quinn's vehicle before it was found. The couple gave details that created a composite sketch of the alleged driver, and police noted that it bore a striking resemblance to Misty but no evidence was ever found that connected Misty or Wesley to Quinn. Interestingly, it was Misty's mother who Quinn's aunt was having dinner with the night he went missing, and both Misty and Wesley were there. The entire case is filled with questions. Who sent the page? What had Quinn heard on the phone? Did Owens actually get in a car accident, or had something else happened that night? What do the lips on the car mean? And where did the puppy come from? There were no answers. The clues didn't add up to anything, didn't lead anywhere, and after a few years, Quinn's case went cold. There were no suspects, and investigators had no idea what happened to Quinn. But then, years later, someone else went missing. In 2015, pregnant Christy Schoen Cod and her husband J.T. Cod were reported missing by their family members. If you recognize her name, Christy appeared on the Food Network series, Food Network Star. Hoping to find the couple at home and the whole thing to be a misunderstanding, police stopped by, but the couple wasn't there. However, their dogs and other important items, such as Christy's purse and JT's wallet, were all left behind, almost like the couple hadn't left at all. Their neighbors reported that the man living next door to the Cods had been acting strangely right after the couple went missing. The man was seen dumping bags into a dumpster, which, when recovered by investigators, revealed a few things owned by Christy, including her ID. When police knocked on the door of the house next to the Cods, Robert Jason Owens opened the door. Owens admitted that he had broken into the Cods' home, which is how he ended up with the garbage bags filled with Christy's things that he then threw into the dumpster. He was charged with breaking and entering and larceny, but Owens didn't have such a simple explanation for what police found when they searched his home. Inside a wood stove, they found what appeared to be human remains. 
Upon this discovery, Owens was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and murder of an unborn child. More evidence was uncovered after fire crews were called to a mobile home that was on fire. There, they found human remains inside of the mobile home. The property it was on was owned by Owens. He didn't offer up an explanation to the police for the human remains in his house, but Owens' wife spoke to investigators anyway, saying that he had told her that his truck got stuck in the mud near the Cod's home. JT had allowed him to borrow his car, and it was while in this car that he claimed to have accidentally hit and killed both of the Cods. Eventually, Owens himself admitted to the killing, though he was adamant it was an accident. Even if it was, he had tried to get rid of the evidence by taking their bodies, cutting them up, and burning them. Owens claimed he didn't want to report the accident because he had been heavily impaired by medications that day. In 2017, Owens officially pled guilty to three counts of second-degree murder and two counts of dismemberment for the Cobb's deaths. With Owens' connection to the Cobb's confirmed, investigators had renewed hope that they would finally know what happened to Quinn after he'd been missing for 15 years. One of Owens' family members finally came forward to speak with police. The story they shared was the first real lead in the case. In January 2000, Owens had dug a pit to burn something. He then poured concrete over the area and told his family he was going to make a fish pond. But he never made the pond, and he later covered the area with dirt. Digging up the area, police found fabric, leather materials, and unknown hard fragments that they never publicly identified. Though these items were never confirmed to be Quinn's, it was enough for Owen to be indicted for first-degree murder of Zeb Quinn. Currently, as of 2021, Robert Jason Owens is awaiting trial. What has yet to be explained is his possible motive, and since Quinn has never been found, it's left many to speculate about the truth of what might be the most baffling unsolved case. Soon, there may finally be answers. <laughs>